Hello, and welcome to today's Syngenics webinar on applications of CREX, a novel functional proteomics technology for the discovery of autoantibody-based companion diagnostics and early disease detection biomarkers. My name is Jonathan Blackburn, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Syngenics. In today's talk, I'll walk you through the company background, the underlying CREX technology and products, and a number of case studies. By way of brief history, the technology that underpins our business today was spun out of my academic group at the University of Cambridge in the early 2000s. Syngenix acquired the worldwide rights to the technology in 2015 and is currently headquartered in Singapore with Swedish and British investors. I won't dwell on this uh, too much, but amongst others, Syngenix is a, is a member of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health Biomarker Consortium, the Industrial Advisory Board of the Human Proteome Organization, the Personalized Medicine uh, Coalition, and the Oslo Cancer Cluster. We've also won a number of awards for innovation that you can see on this slide. Our technology has been widely adopted over the last five years across academia, biotech, and pharma. This slide illustrates some of our partners and also the geographic spread. A particular note, nine of the top 10 pharma companies worldwide are customers of Syngenics today. So let me turn now to our technology. Most people think of Syngenics as a protein microarray company, and indeed most of our business today is in that area. However, the core of our technology is in fact our unique ability to express thousands of human or microbial proteins in a folded functional form suitable for highly multiplexed miniaturized functional assays, be those antibody binding, drug binding, protein-protein interaction, or protein-ligand interaction assays. So the way the technology works is this. We express the recombinant proteins that we're interested in, typically in insect cells, as fusions to an unusual affinity tag, the biotin carboxyl carrier protein domain, or BCCP, from E. coli. The BCCP tag is biotinylated in vivo on a single lysine residue that sits roughly 50 angstroms from the, from the NNC termini, and provides a very simple means to purify and immobilize our expressed proteins onto streptavidin coated surfaces in an oriented manner in a single step. Now it turns out that by serendipity, the BCCB tag is cross-recognized by host biotin ligases in every cell type we've ever looked at, including E. coli, but also yeast, insect cells, and mammalian cells. This seems to be a quirk of the conservation of fatty acid biosynthesis. And what it means is that we can easily move to bacterial or mammalian cells for expression of our proteins if need be. Importantly though, the BCCP tag is only biotinylated in the context of its correct three-dimensional folder structure. If you take the linear peptide epitope harboring the biotinylated lysine residue, turns out that's not a substrate for the biotin ligases. And so another serendipitous discovery we made is that if the upstream fusion partner grossly misfolds, it drives the misfolding or occlusion of the BCCP tag and prevents biotinylation. So the biotinylated state of the, of the resultant fusion protein turns out to be great quality control for the folded state of the proteins that we're interested in. What this means in practice is that to fabricate arrays for downstream assays, we simply print crude lysates of insect cells or mammalian cells or, or bacterial cells expressing the recombinant protein of interest onto our surfaces. The folded bitinylated protein stick and any unfolded proteins and everything else washes away as depicted in this cartoon. And so we end up with arrays of only folded functional proteins. I mentioned surfaces a moment ago. I think that many people understand that it's one thing to express folded functional proteins, but the retaining folded structure following surface immobilization has historically proven to be difficult. We've therefore spent a great deal of time building proprietary hydrogel surfaces that aid preservation of protein function by providing an aqueous-like environment whilst at the same time blocking non-specific macromolecule absorption uh, onto the surface, and so minimizing background binding. During our manufacturing processes, we run quality control checks at every stage of array fabrication. Uh, we run Western blocks of the expressed proteins, and we run assays uh, to determine the amount of immobilized protein in each block on every batch of printed slides. When we put all these components together, what we get is really great technical performance on the chips. We typically see linearity over at least five orders of magnitude, 
couple with very high specificity, which itself is a function of the folded state and structure of the proteins on the chip, since our assays are not plagued by non-specific biologically meaningless binding. We also get very high reproducibility with Pearson correlations uh, between replicates typically above 0.97. One other feature of our platform that we've realized recently is that our low limits of detection mean we really only need around a microliter of sample for serological assays, which means that we can now conceive of um, obviating the need for conventional blood draws or cold chains for sample collection and delivery. And indeed, we've recently launched our own sample collection kit, uh, which we've termed Seromax, uh, to enable this. Since we can control confirmation of proteins on the array surfaces, it means we're not restricted, of course, to monomeric proteins. And we're starting now to build protein complexes on the array surfaces with a view to enabling interrogation of protein function in a more physiologically relevant manner. For example, we can now put T cell receptor heterodimers or influenza hemagglutinin homotrimers onto our, onto our arrays. And although not shown here, we can also handle both peripheral membrane proteins and integral membrane proteins from our platform too. In addition, we can also introduce post-translation modifications or mutations into the arrayed proteins uh, to, to enable systematic analysis of how PTMs in particular modify protein function. So really we're not restricted anymore to the analysis of wild type APO proteins, but we can start to handle the diversity of uh, protein activity and the modification of protein activity that is experienced in biology. Over the years, we've also built a wide repertoire of on-chip functional assays, including phosphorylation, but that is a story for another day. So we have a number of off-the-shelf products today, including um, our immunome array, which is our macro array containing over 1,600 uh, uh, antigens drawn largely from the cancer field, um, but also uh, including a repertoire of signaling molecules and uh, about half the human kinome and transcription factors and the like, um, content shown broadly here. Um, and we use the immunome array for initial discovery applications, particularly in serological studies. We also have um, a cancer-focused uh, chip, this, the cancer testis antigen chip, which contains 262 CT antigens, uh, which we're finding uh, is getting great utility and uptake in the cancer field, both for biomarker discovery, but also for uh, immune-related adverse event prediction uh, studies. Together with David Dane's group in Singapore, we designed um, another cancer-focused chip, the uh, P53 array, containing wild type 53, surrounded by over 100 clinically relevant uh, variant forms of P53, all in a folded functional manner, which, uh, many groups are now using both in biomarker discovery applications but also in drug screening applications to identify compounds that can restore functionality to misfolded p53 variants perhaps most importantly though we also have tremendous capability to produce custom arrays now uh, using the uh, the simple array fabrication methods that i described on previous slides um, and this really produces uh, uh, a great ability to deliver um, focused array content to address specific biological questions with quick turnaround times. And so we can think about custom arrays in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, we can do an initial discovery experiment on an immunome array platform and we can from there cherry pick uh, a set of antigens that have lit up in the discovery experiments and put those onto a focused subarray uh, for downstream validation purposes. Alternatively, we can also work with partners to search the literature and also use uh, novel experimental methodologies, which I'll describe in a minute, um, to identify additional antigens that were not on our macro array, the immunome array, but which are disease focused and which should be on a custom array. And so we're finding applications in all those areas and, cons and considerable interest from our partners, particularly on customization. So I touched on the idea about uh, novel antigen uh, discovery experiments. So we've, dis we've developed in-house a uh, methodology which we call ORVAR, which I can't go into details today, um, but allows us to identify uh, particularly autoantigens that are disease specific. Um, so we're coupling together now the power of mass spectrometry as a discovery tool with uh, a protein microarray technologies as the high throughput, highly quantitative, highly reproducible platform for 
uh, interrogating the relevance of autoantigens in specific diseases. So to give you a quick example of how the Orbar technology works and more importantly, what it delivers, here's some data that we generated um, in the colorectal cancer field using our Orbar technology. So using this approach, we identified a set of 28 novel autoantigens that were not previously in our libraries, but which were found at high frequencies in the colorectal cancer cohort that we were studying, and which included post-translation modified and also mutated forms of antigens. Usefully, we also re-identified antigens which we already had in our libraries and which had lit up in on-chip serological assays before um, using the same cohort, which of course gives great confidence in the, in the results we're getting from the Orbar technology. And so these 28 novel autoantigens that we've discovered um, clearly are not random selections. We can see from GO enrichment analyses that these are not randomly selected proteins. They are disease focused. We can see evidence from other uh, disease areas that, that some of these autoantigens are known autoantigens in other diseases. Um, they were just not known in colorectal cancer before. And so now we've got a means, we think, to enrich our chip with a focus here on uh, autoantigen content that's focused on colorectal cancer. I want now to turn to some specific case studies. But before I do that, I want to pause briefly to tell you what, why so many people are interested in autoantibody biomarkers today. Now, it turns out that the human immune system is exquisitely able to mark out disease-associated changes in proteins, and moreover, that it's able to do so con by constantly sampling entire tissues, not just localized biopsy samples. Now, the dogma in the field is that autoantibodies arise early in disease, um, part, really part of immune surveillance mechanisms, and are easy to amplify. So in theory, should enable pre-symptomatic diagnosis well before clinical symptoms occur. In terms of platforms to quantify autoantibodies, it's worth pointing out that the literature said, suggests that around 90% of antibody epitopes are discontinuous. So by retaining the folded structure of antigens in our chips, we enable access to the full repertoire of both continuous and discontinuous epitopes, whilst not, not suffering from non-specific binding of antibodies to exposed hydrophobic surfaces on unfolded proteins. Let me now turn to some applications of our technology. So one of, we, we've seen clear applicability in disease areas uh, of our platform in the cancer field, in autoimmune diseases, and also in neurological disorders, um, and even infectious diseases now. Um, and so one clear, clear area of application where there's been a lot of uptake, particularly in the academic field, has been in the, early, uh, the search for early diagnostic markers of diseases using autoantibodies. Um, perhaps of greater interest to many of the pharma partners we're interested, we're working with now, is, is using our technology to, to predict response uh, to drug treatment and predict the risk of developing adverse drug reactions um, in cancers and in autoimmune diseases. Um, again, using autoantibodies as the biomarker. And with great relevance to the current pandemic, we're finding that our technology is also uh, proving to be highly relevant to the diagnosis and screening of infectious diseases. But I won't uh, touch on that any further today. So now, in terms of assay protocols, these are really deceptively very simple. Um, so typically we take um, a, a very small volume of whichever sample we're working with, um, can be serum, plasma, CSF, lung lavage, uh, tissue homogenate. We've even recently got data on urine samples. Um, and we take around about a microliter or so of that sample. We dilute that sample uh, very heavily before assay to bring the signals into the linear range for detection. Um, typically for serum assay, we're diluting uh, somewhere around about one in 800 fold before assay. Because what we don't want to do is just see saturation of signals on the chip. We won't want to be able to measure quantitative changes in antibody titers in response to disease progression and in response to drug treatment. Um, so we take that diluted sample, wash it across the chip, allow the autoantibodies to bind, and then the detection assay is really very straightforward. We simply use a fluorescently labeled anti-human IgG um, to, to read out the presence and abundance of the bound autoantibodies. Um, and we read that signal in any microarray scanner, any open format microarray scanner. Now, of course, it'll be obvious to, uh, to most of you that 
um, we can add further uh, further information uh, to the readouts from these chips simply by changing the identity of the detecting reagents here. So if we, uh, we can now run dual color assays using anti-human IgA and anti-human IgG or anti-human IgA, uh, IgM, IgG detection. So those dual color assays work beautifully. We can read out um, Ig subclusters now, IgG subclusters now, and we think we can start to now build um, FC receptor effector functionality straight on the array surface. So we can, we can do more than just saying an antibody is bound. We can start to tell you something about the functionality of the antibodies that have been uh, detected in our system. So let me show you some examples. So on this next slide, um, I'm giving an example of, uh, a, of a diagnostic biomarker study that we carried out with uh, a group in Australia at the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute. Um, who were studying stage three, stage four melanoma uh, patients who were being enrolled for immunotherapy. Um, but we, we did a serological analysis using our CT antigen array in this, in this case, looking at um, baseline samples, so before immunotherapy treatment. And what we found was that we could very readily find a 10 antigen panel that provided a sensitivity of about 93% and a specificity of 89% in discriminating late stage melanoma uh, patients from controls. So that looks pretty good to me. But of course, the diagnostic challenge is not really to distinguish late stage melanoma patients from controls, it's to distinguish stage one or stage two melanoma patients from controls. So how do we get on in earlier stage melanomas? So on the next slide, showing some data from um, another academic group uh, who used our immunoma array technology now, to identify a panel of 10 markers that are able, able to distinguish uh, stage one, stage two melanoma patients from healthy controls with sensitivities of around about 84% and a specificity of 79%. So this now is becoming really very useful in terms of early disease detection. Now, interestingly, those of you with sharp eyes will have spotted that the early and late stage melanoma biomarker panels are a little different to each other. I'm still not exactly certain why that is, it may reflect the fact that two studies were carried out on different cohorts using different arrays that, that share some, but not all of the content. The, the study on this slide was with the immunome arrays, the study on the previous slide with, was, was with our CT antigen array. Or it may be that in a mutagenic tumor, such as melanoma, the late stage tumors have acquired further neoantigens that now dominate the autoimmune response. And it's worth noting here that the stage three, stage four patients in, this, in the previous study had already failed first round chemotherapy. So they're not truly naive, um, they're just naive to immunotherapy. Our collaborators are therefore now busy carrying out longitudinal studies on a melanoma cohort to determine uh, how autoantibody responses change with disease progression and in recurrent disease. And we're also doing something similar in other cancers too now. So I hope to have data on that soon uh, to be able to tell you about. Other academic collaborators have also seen similar performance for diagnostic biomarkers in both early and late stage non-small cell lung cancers. In this case, the study was in fact carried out on exosomes purified from blood, which revealed firstly that the exosomes seem to be a rich source of autoantibodies, which is interesting. And secondly, that there seems to be a strong enrichment for CT antigens in this data set, even though the study was done on our immunome array, which is itself not strongly enriched for CT antigens. So it does, again, uh, speak to the, the importance and disease relevance uh, as biomarkers of the CT antigen collections that we've got. We've also done similar studies in prostate cancer. Um, and the next slide uh, shows some data from two different studies in prostate cancer, one in a South African uh, mixed ethnicity cohort and another in a, in a Chinese Malay cohort. Um, now, the, the study in the South African cohort um, identified amongst others that there were apparent differences in the autoantibody profiles identified in, in different ethnic groups, which of course might make sense given the known differences in HLA allele utilization in different ethnicities. Um, now you'll see from the, the uh, individual uh, dot plots on the right hand side of this uh, figure that individual autoantigens were found to be rel present at relatively low frequencies. But when we put them together in a panel, um, and to create a diagnostic signature, the diagnostic performance really starts to emerge. And that's shown on the next slide. 
uh, where when we plug the data from the prostate cancer patients into receiver operator characteristic curves, it begins to look like we have the makings of a panel that can distinguish, that really can distinguish uh, prostate cancer from benign hyperplasia. And so the, the, te the technical performance here is seeing panels that are giving a sensitivity and specificity of around about 75%, which would definitely be acceptable for a ruling test. And of course, we have better panels than that, but I can't show you that those yet because of patent considerations. When you compare this to the performance of you know, the routinely used uh, prostate-specific antigen, which has an NPV of around about uh, 33%, sorry, a PPV of around, uh, around about 33%, you can see that these autoantibody panels are dramatically outperforming PSA in terms of uh, identifying prostate cancer patients. Now, interestingly, some of the autoantigens previously identified uh, that we found on the chip were previously identified as being highly expressed in prostate cancer samples. And those are the ones shown in orange on this slide. Um, but other proteins uh, that we identified were novel autoantigens um, in prostate cancer. And so we're following up the biological significance of those two now. Usefully, uh, whenever we do biomarker discovery studies, you know, we try to look for uh, supporting orthogonal evidence for the identifications uh, that, we, that we've made. Um, and so here's some data taken from uh, public histology databases where we found direct supporting evidence for the identification of protein tyrosine kinase 7 and testis specific protein Y um, as being upregulated and overexpressed in prostate cancer tissues, but not in surrounding uh, benign tissues. And these were two of the biomarkers identified in our autoantibody panels shown on the previous slide. Now in autoimmune diseases, uh, we find that our autoantibody profiling data can cleanly separate, for example, lupus patients from, con from controls. Um, this slide here shows uh, a volcano plot of the data um, comparing a, a lupus cohort to controls. And it, interestingly, we identify both a set of uh, previously known biomarkers, the ones shown that are boxed in purple, um, but also uh, a whole series of additional biomarkers that are strongly dysregulated, uh, the ones shown in red in the volcano plot, but which are previously unknown markers of lupus. We find a similar story in Sjogren's syndrome too. Um, where data generated on our, on our immunome array platform cleanly distinguishes uh, primary Sjogren syndrome from non-Sjogren sicker syndrome, um, as well as from healthy controls. The novel autoantigens though, that we're identifying, um, really seem to provide discrimination, not only between the different uh, syndromes that have similar clinical manifestation, but also from potentially, from other potentially overlapping autoimmune conditions such as lupus and so on. This, uh, slide here in the Venn diagram, we can see that there are collections of markers that are found, in, that are found unique to primary Sjogren syndrome and also other markers that overlap strongly uh, with uh, both non Sjogren sicker and also with, uh, uh, with lupus. One of the important things that I think is important about our data is that it, it's quantitative. And the quantitative analysis goes well beyond uh, just identification diagnostic markers. And we think that the, the, the data we're generating on our array platform is now informing on the spectrum of disease and also on subtypes of disease. So, for example, in, in the Sjogren's cohort, we found that all patients called as anti-SSA or anti-SSB uh, positive by ELISA were also called positive by our array data. But that a significant number of patients who were called negative by ELISA came out as positive on our chips, which we think is simply a function of our higher signal to noise ratios and also more sensitive detectors relative to ELISA. But interestingly, we also found that the primary Sjogren's patients appeared to fall into three distinct subgroups based on their autoantibody profiles, as shown in the PCA plots in the right hand panel here. So, of course, we're now really interested to understand with our clinical partners what the significance of those uh, subgroups might be. We found a similar picture in lupus patients too. Uh, the data on the next slide is from a large study involving around about 280 lupus patients in the UK or US and an equivalent number of controls. Serological analysis on our immunomeray platform identified 11 previously known lupus autoantigens, but also identified 68 novel autoantigens, which is already in itself very interesting. 
But perhaps more interesting, as with the uh, Sjogren's uh, data, the, the autoantibody profiling data that we generated separated the lupus patients into four distinct subgroups now, as shown in the left-hand panel on this slide. Now those subgroups uh, replicated through a validation cohort, so it looks like they are real. And when you start to then ask, what do these subclusters, what do these subgroups correlate with? It turns out that the, the, the right hand most cluster, uh, which we've termed SLE1B here, if you've got sharp eyes, um, correlates with high levels of antinuclear antibody titers. The next most right hand uh, cluster correlates with high levels of anti double strand DNA antibodies. Whereas the two left hand clusters had low levels of ANA and low levels of anti double strand DNA antibodies, yet were clinically classified as clear lupus patients. And so the clinicians think that these patients now represent a distinct subtype of lupus. But when we look in more detail at what's driving the classification uh, into, those, into those individual subgroups, we can see some fur something further interesting uh, information that comes out. So the, the, uh, the strongly ANA positive uh, cluster, uh, the red cluster on the previous slide, is shown here uh, kind of in the western, the western region of this plot here, with um, proteins involved in um, uh, RNA processing, spliceosome, um, and nucleocytoplasmic transport um, being found as autoantigens in those diseases. Um, whereas the strongly double strand DNA, anti double strand DNA positive sample, was enriched in antigens, or I should say, enriched in autoantibodies against antigens that are involved in TGF beta and Wnt signaling. And one of the two large left hand clusters that were low, was low in ANA and low in double strand DNA antibody titers was enriched in autoantibodies against antigens involved in TLR signaling, NF kappa B activation, um, and also in B and T cell development processes. And so, what this is really telling us, I think, is that whilst we're not uh, supposing that all of these antigens are directly involved or all of the autoantibodies are directly involved in pathogenesis, it does speak, I think, very strongly to the idea that these subgroups are not just chance associations, but that the pattern, the specific pattern of autoantibodies we're finding is telling us about different underlying etiologies in the different subgroups. And it's also potentially telling us that these subgroups may well respond to different treatments, which of course is something we're now following up with some of our partners. We've also seen recently stratification of individuals based not only on disease, but also on age and wellness. And so the next slide shows, study from, uh, shows data from a study done by collaborators at ASTAR in Singapore, who were interested in studying aging phenotypes and health trajectories. Um, now they put together a cohort of 340 elderly patients and 60 young controls. And interestingly, the autoantibody data generated on our immunome array platform cleanly separates the elderly based on whether they were old and well or old and infirm or old but with some intermediary, intermediate phenotype. And this probably reflects in part comorbidities that people have been exposed to over time. But interestingly, um, some of the biomarkers appear to track back to earlier age, particularly from the old but healthy individuals, um, perhaps suggesting a protective role for certain of these autoantibodies, um, uh, perhaps a vestige of uh, earlier immune surveillance uh, that was controlling disease development. And this is something we're obviously very keen to follow up on now. Turning to companion diagnostics now, we've generated quite a bit of data with pharma partners in recent years that we can't talk about for obvious reasons. But here's an example that we can show where our autoantibody data has been able to stratify rheumatoid arthritis patients at baseline into responder and non-responder groups. Um, this slide shows data from a study done uh, with an academic group in Taiwan who were looking specifically at, at uh, RA patient response to Humira. And so the study involved uh, around about 60 participants, um, split roughly 50-50 between um, uh, responders and non-responder phenotypes. Um, and initially we carried out a study at week 24, serum samples at week 24 uh, following drug administration. We found there a clean signature that differentiated responder from non-responder phenotypes. But of course, that's not really what, what companion diagnostics are really aiming for. So we then went back and said, well, do we find a similar signature um, in, uh, at the baseline samples? And when we looked, we indeed found that at baseline, we could find 
um, a, a diagnostic biomarker panel, which I can't reveal the details of because it's um, because it's subject to patent considerations right now, but which gives um, very usable sensitivity and specificities of, o, of over 0.8 uh, for sensitivity and about 0.78 for specificity. So this is now becoming very useful, we think, in terms of predicting who's going to respond to Humira in this cohort. And interestingly, um, when, we, when we step back and ask, well, what, is, is there some rationalization, again, for the, identi for the identity of the biomarkers that are providing the classification? It turns out that uh, on, deep, on deeper analysis, the signature that we pulled out was in fact predicting the risk of developing an anti-drug neutralizing antibody response in those individuals. Um, but I stress that this was a baseline before drug administration, not in response to drug administration. Um, so the, the data not only stratifies patients, but also, also tells us, I think, something about underlying mechanism uh, by which uh, treatment response or lack thereof is occurring. We've also seen uh, evidence of similar stratification in melanoma patients in terms of the likelihood of response to checkpoint blockade. And so the next slide shows some data from um, a cohort of metastatic melanoma patients who were all carrying a BRAF B600 EK mutation um, and who were treated with pembrolizumab. Um, and interestingly, the data that we generated, again, this was with our CT antigen array, um, showed that we could see a clear differential between the anti autoantibody signatures we were seeing for patients who were showing either a complete or partial response um, as distinct from people showing um, progressive disease. And really the difference was characterized by uh, two, two components, one of which was the number of different antigens that were lighting upon the chip, and the other of which was the, the magnitude of the titers we were measuring. So if you compare on this slide, kind of the, the top, um, the top uh, histogram to the middle histogram, you'll notice that the, that the scale on the y-axis is tenfold different between the two plots. And so in the people showing uh, progressive disease, we could measure very little, if, if any, autoantibody response. Uh, in people showing a complete response or partial response, we're seeing strong, specific uh, autoantibody signals. And so what we think is happening is that our array data is reading out uh, the extent of immune engagement by the host immune system with the tumor. Um, and the, that clearly must be a component, a strong component of immunological response to, uh, to checkpoint blockade. Interestingly, we've also seen a similar ability to stratify melanoma patients in terms of response to chemotherapy. Um, and the next slide shows data from a retrospective analysis of non-resectable malignant melanoma patients who were treated with um, a BRAF MEK inhibitor cocktail. Uh, and what our data showed when we looked at the, the autoantibody, uh, autoantibody titers um, as a function of time post-treatment, and correlated that with the clinical score for, uh, to, for whether it was partial response, stable disease, or progressive disease at individual time points, what we, what we saw was a really interesting pattern emerging. That in patients showing partial response or complete response to chemotherapy, we saw that at time intervals following each bout of chemotherapy, we, we would see that the autoantibody titers on average were increasing uh, compared to the pretreatment uh, titers. And this, of course, would be consistent with the idea that the chemotherapy is working, it's driving tumor cell death, spilling additional tumor antigens into the lymph, into the lymph system and uh, boosting the immune response that was already there. In patients showing progressive disease, we saw the opposite phenotype, um, where in uh, successive time points uh, following uh, chemotherapy treatment, we saw the average autoantibody titers were declining with time. And of course, you could imagine that that might be um, the opposite phenomenon, indicative that the tumors are becoming resistant to the chemotherapy. So in both those two cases, you could argue perhaps that what we're seeing is, is, is a readout of the symptom um, of whether the patient will res respond or not, rather than being predictive. So the group that was most interesting in that regard is the, sta the, the group that the clinicians called as having stable disease. So chemotherapy apparently having no, um, uh, having no effect uh, as far as they could judge. And now what we saw was that those stable disease patients fell into two distinct groups, according to our uh, protein microarray data. Uh, one group 
um, illustrated by the plot on this slide here, where following the round bouts of chemotherapy, although there was no tumor shrinkage, the average autoantibody titer was still going up um, uh, following each bout of chemotherapy, suggesting something was still happening with chemo. Um, the other group were characterized by having no measurable antibody response at all on our chips following chemotherapy intervention. And so, interestingly, that other group uh, were all dead three weeks later. Now, the numbers were not huge in terms of patients, and the study wasn't designed with that observation or that endpoint in mind. Um, so we don't really know quite what was going on in those patients yet. Something we're following up again. Um, but it may well be that what we were observing on our chip was an early indication of a total collapse of the immune system in those individuals. Uh, certainly, it was telling us something about the patients that clinicians did not know and had not anticipated. So in those cases, clearly, I think our array data is becoming predictive about outcomes, not just symptomatic of outcomes. There's, of course, a great deal of interest um, in the, in the immuno-oncology field, not only in predicting response to treatment, but also in uh, predicting the risk of developing immune-related adverse events. And so on the next slide, I'm showing some data from a study that we published recently with collaborators um, from a phase one safety trial, um, looking, uh, if you're interested in the details, looking at the effect of interlesional BCG uh, vaccination prior to treatment with checkpoint blockade. Now this, two, this safety trial was only five patients and it was stopped after five patients because two of the five generated high-grade high immune-related adverse events. Um, and so we were asked to do a retrospective uh, serological analysis on this, on this small cohort using our immunome array platform. And the, the picture that came out was really very striking, um, that the two patients who developed the high-grade immune-related adverse events showed a pattern of uh, autoantibody binding to our chips that was unlike anything we normally see in, in uh, in normal cancer cohorts. Um, we saw both a magnitude and also a breadth of antigen recognition by autoantibodies in these patients um, that was far higher than we typically see in normal cancer patients and far higher than we saw in the, co in the three individuals who developed either no or low grade immune related adverse events. And the important thing, the really important thing here is that those signatures were measurable before checkpoint blockade. And so what we think is emerging now is a picture that really says moving on from the idea uh, or building on the idea that uh, the autoantibody data is reading out the extent of immune engagement with the tumor. Um, perhaps if that, extent, if that extent of engagement is too great, there's a high risk of triggering immune related adverse events. And so these are observations that again, we're, we're beginning to follow up now with, uh, with key partners. Now, of course, there are lots of publications behind all of the work that I described today, um, but I haven't got time to go through all, all of those. We can make those available if you're interested. Um, they're all on our website. Um, so what I hope you'll take home from today is that Syngenics CREPS platform is a, is a really unique and hugely powerful tool for the discovery of novel autoantibody signatures, and that those signatures are useful in early disease diagnosis, but also in companion diagnostics, and even for prediction of the risk of development of immune-related adverse events. And it's relevant in, in cancers and in autoimmune diseases. And I haven't shown you today any data on neurological disorders, but we have that too. And so with that, I'll finish, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have via the Q&A box on your screens. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jonathan Blackburn speaking again. Uh, now, hopefully, uh, hopefully live now. So we've had a few questions from the audience um, already come in. If there are other questions, please uh, please type them into the chat box, um, and I'll pick them up as as we go through. So I'll try to put the questions into some uh, into chronological order in, in terms of the time they came in at. Um, so. So the, one of the first questions that came in um, related to the use of our OVAR technology, and specifically whether it could pick up also antibodies that bind to mimic epitopes. So if I understand the question correctly, um, I think the answer is probably yes, um, in that 
we're using, uh, in the Orva method, we're using the autoantibodies themselves to identify for us the autoantibodies. And so if the autoantibodies that are naturally occurring are able to bind to um, uh, both epitopes on specific autoantigens and also to mimetopes on other proteins, those would, of course, be biologically relevant uh, cross-recognition events. And so we would expect to find both of those events coming through in our databases. Um, I guess the other aspect to another angle to the question might relate to um, the, the issue of whether there is mimic, antigen mimicry between uh, viral or bacterial infections and human proteins. And of course, with the way that our system uh, works at the present time, we would identify the, the human target for the autoantibodies, not necessarily the bacterial or viral driver for it. But we can think of adaptions of our technology to, to take us towards those original uh, uh, original microbial uh, stimuli that might have given rise to the um, original antibody recognition that, uh, that then uh, switched epitope to a human epitope. Another question around uh, whether the surfaces that we're working on allow label-free detection, um, uh, for example, by uh, surface plasma resonance or bilayer interferometry. So the, the simple answer is yes, because we're working with uh, in, in vivo bitinylated uh, proteins. Um, and so although we uh, ordinarily uh, for discovery applications put those, uh, put those antigens onto a streptavidin coated micro, micro array surface, we can of course very readily put those uh, same antigens onto a multitude of different formats. Um, something I didn't cover really in today's webinar, but um, we've got direct data and direct evidence of putting our proteins onto BLI surfaces, bilayer interferometry surfaces. Uh, SPR would be straightforward. Uh, we can also, and we do uh, uh, periodically, put our antigens onto streptavidin coated beads as well. So, you know, we're, we're very open um, if people want or need uh, antigens that have come through from the primary discovery experiments. If, they, if we want to put those onto different formats, that's very straightforward. Um, got another question um, relating to the uh, translational power and predictability, uh, uh, and particularly the clinical significance of our of our arrays and our data sets. Um, and I think the question specifically is uh, is asking why all our off-the-shelf arrays are, are not made in mammalian cells, and whether we're planning chips that would express uh, have proteins that are expressed in mammalian cells. So th that's quite a complex question. Um, we, we use insect cells as our stock system. Um, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the course of the webinar, um, we, are, we do have the capability of moving expression of any of our antigens into, into a, um, a high eukaryotic system, a mammalian system if we want to, or back down into a bacterial system if we want to. Um, so the reason for choosing um, uh, a, uh, an insect cell system as the base is because you know, we, we know that we get um, eukaryotic-like uh, glycosylation patterns in insect cells. Um, and yet insect cells are much easier to work with in kind of true high throughput formats. Um, you know, it, it, so it basically makes it simpler for us to express thousands of human proteins in parallel in insect cells than it would be if we were in a mammalian cell system. And for the vast majority of the applications that we work in, um, it turns out that the precise glycosylation pattern doesn't seem to really uh, make a huge difference to autoantibody recognition. Now, of course, we recognize that it is possible that it could make a difference, um, but we all know that antibodies don't really like binding to glycans. Um, uh, glycan targeting antibodies are, uh, you know, are pretty rare. Um, and so um, we've so far seen no limitation in having insect cell expressed proteins. Um, the, the other component to the, to the answer, I think, is perhaps uh, slightly more subtle, that um, when we describe insect cells as having uh, eukaryotic-like glycosylation, the question is, what does that really mean? So what it means is it's more complex glycosylation than you'd see in, um, in yeast cells, slightly less complex than you get in mammalian cells. But of course, every different mammalian tissue will uh, potentially put on a different pattern of glycosylation. So it's not entirely clear what mammalian glycosylation is. It's certainly not a uniform state of glycosylation that you find in every cell type. Um, 
So in cases where we, we know or where people think that glycosylation is critical, we can shift the expression to mammalian cells. But for our off-the-shelf uh, chips, uh, we, we routinely work in, um, in insect cell for expression, unless we're dealing with uh, microbial proteins, in which case we might well use um, a bacterial host for those. Um, there's another question um, relating to, um, I think, something that I went through you know, briefly in the webinar around whether precision subtyping of diseases might be able to help design more precise treatments for diseases. So that's a really interesting concept, um, one that um, I, I think may well start to gain more traction. Um, but the classic way in which people think about precision medicine is um, that they spent a you know, great deal of time and uh, a lot of money developing a drug and now uh, and that's been approved and what you want to know what people want to know is which subset of the population would respond to the drug that has been developed and that is already approved. Um, and so, you know, we've done a lot of work with uh, pharma partners and with academic partners, um, as I alluded to in the talk, looking, uh, identifying uh, uh, biomarker panels that will stratify uh, cohorts into responder, non-responder phenotype. But of course, it's very, it's very reasonable to think about turning that problem on its head and say, well, if we know that subtypes of disease exist, and if we, if we can identify distinct subtypes that have different etiologies, then presumably those subtypes should be candidates for targeted drug development processes. So um, it's not something we've got experience in. We're not a drug discovery company ourselves. Um, but uh, you know, I think the ability to stratify patients prior to clinical trials um, could well be a very interesting approach in the future, um, particularly with you know, all the emphasis now on um, uh, running much smaller human clinical trials in the early stages, and so a kind of a more precise selection of, of a target cohort to go into the clinical trials, I, I suspect will be the future. Um, one of the things that I didn't really touch on in the, in the webinar, but perhaps is relevant, is that when, when, you, when you step back and ask why, why is it that why do we think that we're getting uh, autoantibody definition of uh, distinct subtypes of disease? So I, you know, I think my answer to that is that um, by analogy, you know, everybody's very familiar now with the concept of there being transcriptomic subtypes of disease in cancers and presumably in many other disorders. And of course, the, the downstream manifestation of that altered transcriptomic profile will in some cases be uh, altered and aberrant overexpression of specific proteins. Now, overexpression of proteins is one way of breaking tolerance and generating an autoantibody response. It's not necessarily, it's, it's not an obligate method, but it is one of the method, one of the mechanisms by which autoantibodies are thought to be produced. And so, you know, just simplistically, you might imagine that uh, having uh, different populations with different patterns of overexpressed protein, transcriptomic subtypes, would potentially be reflected um, in the autoimmune profile. And then if you layer on top of that, um, distinct patterns of neoantigen production, particularly in cancers, uh, different patterns of uh, mutation, for example, um, then those would also drive autoantigen, uh, autoantibody production um, that we would see on the chip. And so again, we would expect to see distinct subtypes coming out. So we think that the auto autoantibody uh, marked out subtypes of disease that we're seeing are directly connected to, to to the underlying biology, the underlying etiology. And so I think, you know, the, the idea that was put in the question about using those subtypes to design more precise treatments of disease, uh, I think is something we'd be very interested to explore with people um, in, in the future. Um, there was another question that came in uh, relating to um, whether, whether there are examples of immune maturation with um, showing increasing affinities of antibodies for certain antigens or components of antigens, um, particularly with respect to you know, Im immunization and vaccine response monitoring. So that's, a, that's a, a, an interesting area. Um, we don't have many examples yet of longitudinal studies on the same individual because most clinical cohorts uh, that, that our collaborators have, have brought to us so far have not had that characteristic. Uh, 
Um, but but one of the areas where we where we are seeing this immediately um, aspect of our technology that I haven't talked about today, but the you know, we we built um, array array based products uh, for detection of auto an, uh, of antibody responses in COVID nineteen patients, and we are literally hot off the press. We're we're busy running a longitudinal cohort now um, of healthcare workers who have contracted disease um, COVID nineteen disease. And we're tracking those patients uh, using our technology um, through through acute disease and through convalescence. And it's very interesting that we are seeing um, direct evidence now of what this question is asking, which is uh, both a, a change in the in the um, titer of the antibodies, um, as well as a broadening out of the repertoire of epitopes and antigens that are being recognised in uh, as disease progresses in specific individuals. And so, because of our technology it provides a quantitative readout, um, and we can, from that quantitative readout, get a measure of affinity, um, at, at least judged by reciprocal titers measured straight from the chip surface, um, we, we are starting to see this, uh, uh, this change in the maturation of the immune system um, in disease progression. We're also starting now, interestingly, to um, look at, uh, in the same cohorts, uh, we're, we're now generating data uh, to track how the immunoglobulin class and subclass uh, changes as a function of time through disease. Um, we don't have data to be able to show on that yet. Um, it's, it's too early, but I think those, you know, those are things that we would expect to change with time. And indeed, we're now also just, just you know, on, the, on the cusp of starting to measure um, FC effector function of the antibodies directly on the chip surface also. And again, you know, I think the expectation is because we've got a quantitative readout, that we'll be able to track how the FC function uh, of the of the antibodies changes uh, with time in individual patients. So the key to all of these things, of course, is longitudinal cohorts. Um, but it does look like our technology is is able to provide those answers. Um, so there's another question that's just come in around the specificity of the secondary antibodies that we use to detect the autoantibodies and whether these are commercial ones or, or ones that we generate ourselves. So the, the, the simple answer is that, that um, we're very careful about the, auto an about the detecting antibodies we use. Um, we, on, our, on our array products, um, we in fact put down uh, control spots of um, human IgG, human IgA, human IgM. So we can see very clearly that, uh, excuse me, we can see very clearly that our secondary antibodies are, are antibody class Specific. So our anti-IgG antibodies only detect IgG, anti-IgA also only detects IgA, and so so on and so forth. It becomes more more of an issue actually when we start looking at uh, IgG subclass detection. Um, and we now have we now got uh, sources, commercial sources of anti-IgG one two three four antibodies that that appear to be uh, subclass specific, which of course is a prerequisite for interpreting the data that will come out of there. So we know it's you know we know that it is an issue and not all antibodies are are specific, but we make sure we measure those those uh, cross any cross reactivity and only work with um, detecting antibodies that don't show cross reactivity in our assay platform. Um, there was a question about whether I could share the publication on the aging associated autoimmune profile. Um, I would love to be able to. Uh, we're just about to submit that for publication right now. We filed patent applications on what we've discovered. Um, the publications are the publication is about to be submitted, um, and uh, we'll be able to share it once once it's been peer reviewed. Um, okay, so I think there was some more. Um, have I gone through all the questions now? Trying to just see if I've got all the questions. Okay, so here, there's one that um, uh, that, that I think uh, I haven't got to yet. There's a question around whether there are um, applications for detecting specific pathological aspects of cancer. Um, and to uh, it says to aim specific proteins. I'm not quite sure what what the question is driving at there. Um, 
So uh, I think perhaps this question is really um, aimed at the you know the 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 same issue around distinct subtypes of disease. Um, certainly, one of the things that we're interested in the cancer space, and and I should say when I say we, what I mean is Syngenics in collaboration with um, clinical and biomedical collaborators, um, is is the question of how the autoantibody profiles that we're that we're measuring um, correlate with with both disease progression and with uh, treatment outcomes, but particularly on the disease progression side of things. Um, you know, it's well, it's well understood that different, um, <clears throat> the different antibody uh, subclasses uh, have different functional properties. And so, for example, an IgG1 is thought to be immune suppressive, whereas, uh, 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 sorry, is tumor, IgG1 is thought to be tumoricidal, whereas IgG4 may be more immune suppressive. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very keen to start teasing apart that additional layer of information around how the antibodies themselves might be correlated with, um, with, with disease progression. But at the same time, you know, the, the identity of the autoantibodies, uh, of the autoantigens that are recognized by the autoantibodies, we think is telling us something about uh, pathology of, uh, of cancers. We can see it pretty clearly in autoimmune diseases so far, but we, do, we think it's happening in cancers, cancers as well now. So, so yes, I think, um, although I can't provide as much detail around you know, the pathological link between uh, the autoantigens and cancers as we can in the in the autoimmune disease presently. I, I, my sense is that, that that is coming out of the data we're, we're generating now. Um, so there's another question around whether there are differences between men and women in terms of autoantibody profiles in cancer and other diseases. Um, so I don't have much data about gender bias in cancers. Um, in uh, in a number of autoimmune conditions, it's well it's well known that um, diseases such as lupus and Sjogren's uh, have a strong bias uh, uh, towards uh, female patients. So there's a much higher prevalence in women for a number of autoimmune conditions. Um, so the studies that we've been engaged in and, and uh, partners on so far have haven't aimed to look at those questions specifically. But the literature does support the idea that there would be a gender difference in certain uh, in, in susceptibility and therefore in um, also antibody profiles uh, down the line. Um, <clears throat> so there's another question that's just come in um, around whether uh, whether cohorts from uh, but well characterized cohorts uh, might correlate with increased uh, cardiometabolic disease risk. Um, I guess the question is really thinking here about diabetes um, and that is somehow associated with uh, social deprivation. Um, it would be, a, would be a very interesting study to do. Um, we have got data in the diabetes field. Uh, we've looked at both type 1 and type 2 diabetes and we do see also antibody profiles in both. Um, and um, but but they've been to, to date they've been relatively small studies. Um, they've not been aimed at uh, looking at this specific question by any means. They've been really more uh, aimed at, at the present time at questions of whether we can distinguish you know uh, type one or type two diabetes from controls rather than um, looking at the mechanistic the underlying mechanistic basis of disease risk. Um, but um, you know, if if we consider that um, that in that in certainly in some of the cardiometabolic diseases we'd expect to see aberrant glycation of proteins, that might be one mechanism by which uh, an autoantibody response could be triggered. Because we know that aberrant post-translation modification does drive uh, autoimmune uh, disease. Um, the classic example being citrullination in rheumatoid arthritis. And so when we put citrulline modifications into our chips, we start to see we start to be able to read out citrulline specific uh, autoantibody signals. So although we haven't done this in terms of aberrant glycation yet, it's a you know, very interesting, very interesting suggestion. One perhaps that would be interesting to follow up with in due course. Okay, so I'm conscious that we are getting very close to the end of our time now. Um, so, um, there's a question, uh, another question that's come in that uh, says it's not a science question, but um, 
what would be the next technological advance that would drive the price of, of Syngenics to be affordable? Um, well, so so that's an interesting question and something we're working on right now. Uh, we've got some ideas. I, can't, I think I can't tell you too much about about that right now, but um, I can say watch this space. Uh, we've, we've got some ideas about how to bring down the cost of access to our technology. Um, and I think you'll see examples of that coming in the new year. Um, if we've still got time, um, there's another question here that says, do, do I think, do we think that our platform can be used to detect antibodies to SARS-CoV-2? And would, would it be better than those that are currently available? Um, so the, the short answer is y yes, it can. And in fact, we have uh, we've produced an array product recently uh, that comprises um, uh, a multi-antigen SARS-CoV-2 antibody detection platform. So we've got a platform where we both have the nuclear capsule protein and also the spike protein on the chip. And we've got that not only those two antigens, but also in component resolved forms of those two antigens, where we have kind of epitope resolution of the of antibody binding to to the spike protein. So we have the full length spike trimer on the chip, but we've also got um, the S1 domain and the RBD on the chip. So we can start to tease apart where the antibodies are binding, not just that there are, are antibodies. And we're now building on that chip um, uh, assays to, to get direct evidence, um, not only of antibody binding, but also of neutralization assay in an in vitro assay. Um, and so, yes, so, so we have, uh, we, we have uh, a great platform for detecting antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. We think it is very different to what's currently available, not not least because you know, we have, we're able to get quantitative readouts straight from the chip surface. So we're able to tell not just that there is an antibody, but also what the titer is and wh where it's binding in the target proteins. Okay, so I think we've come just about to the end of our time today. Um, and I think I've gone through all the questions that have been asked today. Um, so in which case, I think if there are no further questions, I will uh, thank everybody for attending the webinar today and for the very interesting questions. Um, if you've got any further questions, uh, please, please feel free to email me um, at Syngenics and we'll do our best to reply. Um, and so with that, I thank you and I will draw this, draw this webinar to an end.